I want to talk about monitoring and logging and basically everything that goes along with that uh, in a system. So in software engineering, honestly, one of the more difficult parts is creating a system that has the correct and right monitoring in place that actually is useful. And when I say useful, what I really mean is that it doesn't require manual intervention if something goes wrong in the system. So for example, if one of your instances of your uh, application exceeds a certain CPU threshold, um, you know, let's say if you have a lot of WebSocket connections or if you have uh, a lot of maybe long running processes in the background that don't really do a good job of disposing of resources or whatever it is, or you just have a CPU spike for whatever reason. Um, it's important to have uh, some kind of alerting to indicate that. So if your CPU, if your CPU usage exceeds, let's say 80% uh, utilization on that instance, you should have an alert that, that notifies you somewhere, but then takes action on that notification automatically. Whether that is scaling out the instance, um, it could be if you're hosting on a cloud, uh, if you're hosting on a cloud, in cloud infrastructure, let's say AWS, and you're on a smaller uh, instance size, um, I forget what the instance size is, like T3, T1, I forget what, I can't remember the names, but if you're on a small one uh, and you need to scale to something that has more uh, hardware at your disposal, for in this case, a greater, uh, more CPU power, it could automatically scale to the next instance. So this is auto scaling and that's what this is referred to as. And you can set different thresholds to enable your auto scaling and when that, when that will happen, when that will trigger to auto scale up, but also when it will auto scale back down. So you're not spending a bunch of money on a larger instance that you don't maybe need. Um, and all that should happen manually. If, if, some, if your CPU utilization is so high that somebody has to go and manually bump that instance up to the next spot, something's probably wrong in your system that you need to correct that manual intervention and introduce some some form of auto scaling. The same can go for memory consumption. Uh, memory is a little harder to track, especially, you know, whatever the nature of your application or, or API background service, whatever it is, your application is going to consume some amount of memory and it's going to consume memory uh, when it starts up, you'll see initial spike of how much kind of memory is needed just to run the application. But as your background processes continue to run for a while, um, some of those long running background processes tend to leak memory. So you have to kind of be mindful of how much memory do we anticipate this kind of growing, you know, expanding and taking up um, during high traffic periods. Or honestly, just that random occasion where you have all the wrong things that could happen at once and your long running background processes uh, are held up because they're they've due to memory leaks or uh, all of a sudden they just require a lot more because the demand on the system is so high. Um, this can also be caused by um, a lot of WebSocket connections because those require memory on the host. And so if you have more users all requiring a single WebSocket connection, uh, you can experience an increased memory um, consumption on the, uh, the server or the instance. So the same way we did that with CPU utilization, you can set that up for memory. So if you have memory uh, exceeding you know, 75% usage, uh, something needs to happen. There needs to be some form of scaling that happens uh, to accommodate that. But if somebody has to go in and manually do that, you're alerting, I mean, what's really the point? Because somebody has, still has to go and do that. And if that happens, you know, off hours or like just some random period in the middle of the night, that should that should be an indication to you that you, you need to take the steps to make that automatic. Because what, what I think what happens is that when we make systems you know, we, we get it up to a certain point where it works, but then we kind of get sidetracked with other things and we never actually go back and put those, um, you know, those, those quality of life enhancements in the system uh, for auto scaling and just avoiding having to get on there manually and, and upgrade the instance sizes.
Um, this is difficult because again, it's, it's another series of steps and it's a little bit, you're, you're kind of encroaching upon like the gray area of like what the scope of responsibility is for a, uh, software engineer, you know, because you could see that as being like, a more of like an infrastructure role rather than a, a full stack role, depending on how large your, your company is. Um, and now if it's just you creating your own systems and you, you're just by yourself, then you'll have to figure out how you want to handle that. If you host on the cloud, a lot of that, you can kind of get out of the box for you. You can also set up triggers to trigger actions to happen in cloud environments. Like if your memory, CPU utilization, whatever it is, uh, exceeds a certain threshold, you can trigger an alert that will then trigger a series of steps that you define, such as increasing your instances, uh, it's adding nodes to the cluster or adding memory, whatever it is. Um, those can all, that can all be automated. So you don't actually have to physically go and do that. The only physical step that you should have to do is really just go and read the logs for what happened and see what caused the auto scaling event. Um, and I think that, uh, this is, this is one of the harder parts of designing a system is getting all this stuff in place in a way where it makes sense and you know it's it's accounted for the same thing with logging too logging is actually logging is quite difficult to 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 do correctly because you know it's one thing to have logs of like you know what's happening in your system you know you you want to see like request logs you want to see uh, some form of response logs um but you, you also need logs that will that will generally help you diagnose uh, issues. And you want those logs to be very, you know, plain, you know, clear text, you know, that, that is, for me, plain English that I can read and make sense of. And it sounds easy, like it sounds, oh, you know, oh, you can just add a sentence to, you know, this spot in the code, that spot in the code. But it's a little trickier because you don't, you know, you don't know where that unforeseen issue is going to happen. So it's hard to add logging to every spot that you maybe anticipate an error happening at um, without having a lot of experience uh, in the system. And I, I think it's I think it's difficult to create logging that actually serves a purpose too, um, because everything has a cost associated with it. So if you just spam your system with you know, millions and millions of logs, but they don't really add value. It's not really, it's not much of a point maybe beyond just capturing, you know, throughput metrics, which is, you know, has its place, but you can do that with other, with other things as well. It doesn't have to be explicit logging. You can do that with some kind of telemetry Mac, um, telemetry tracking on HTTP client requests. Um, so logging is, is, is tricky and there's different, you know, there's different log levels in the .NET world, like information, debug, warning, error, um, critical. Uh, and I, you can specify the log level you want to log at, depending on what environment you want to, you, you're, you're in. So maybe, you know, if you're in development, maybe you want to log everything. So you set the log level at, at maybe info. But in a production system, maybe you don't want all that information logging. Maybe you want to just set it at uh, warning or, you know, whatever it is. Um, and the reason it, it's, it's difficult is because you don't want to just go and arbitrarily add logs to places you think need logs. It requires a little bit of thought and, and a little bit of art. It's, it's a little bit of an art to add logging that actually produces you know, some form of good results. Because if someone, <clears throat> if someone's coming into your system and trying to make sense of it, the first thing that they're going to do is generally look at the logging and kind of see what they can decipher from the logs. Uh, but if there's, if, if the logs are just a record of uh, requests and responses, it can be a little difficult to understand what the purpose is and what the intent of the code is, because I think that that's a little bit what logs need to cover is, is 
you know, I understand I can look at the request and look at the, the request payload and look at the response. You know, that's we need to see that stuff. But what's the purpose of that request? What is it actually? What, what, what is this doing? And that's the harder part, right? Why are we sending that request in the first place? What are we doing with that information that's coming back? And that's the harder part that can sometimes be left out of a system. And what happens is that somebody has to go and learn why we're making those requests to begin with. But if we have appropriate logging in place, I think that we can add that type of intent into our system that is readable and makes sense. Now, it's hard because you you have to, again, you, you, you have to do the grain of salt. You can't just add a bunch of sentences everywhere and log that and just call it a day. That's all I'm saying. You have to be selective and careful. And I think that you need to study the logs a little bit to see what what is there and what's not and you have to I think make some form of dashboard that that shows you what metrics you currently have but then you need to ask you kind of need to ask around to see like you know okay what are the things that we should be tracking in our system and try to ask those questions because I think the responses to those questions are going to lead you down the path that's going to inform you of where you might need to add logging into your system. And once you figure out the metrics that you're trying to track, I think it's going to be a lot more clear as to, you know, what the intent of a lot of that stuff is. Um, and I, I think another part too is that, you know, all the same thing with monitoring. Um, you can really get smart about how you react to log messages in your alerting system meaning you can check for specific logs and if you see a if you see a rise in let's say a one log statement that you put in like some retry loop or a catch or something like that if you see a spike in those kind of logs you can make a reactive function based off of that meaning if you see a let's say a spike of a thousand log messages at a particular spot in your code that is only triggered by like a retry after a certain threshold or inside of a cache block or you know wherever it is you can create a, a, a function depending on what environment you're in if, if you're in a cloud environment you can create a, a, a function off that to trigger something and if you create that theoretically what you could do is you can create a call to maybe let's say like a lambda function that maybe changes the setting and that setting restricts that code that keeps erroring and it bypasses that to go to another spot. And that's the kind of reactive systems that we really need to add in to avoid all this manual intervention that, um, that, that might be necessary. Now, I'm not saying that that's what you should do, but I'm saying that that level of responsiveness is possible depending on how your system is set up um, and one of the things that I personally like to, to do is it, it's it's easier to mitigate errors and issues if everything is wrapped behind some form of, you know, feature flagging or a setting or uh, anything like that. And I'm not everything shouldn't be behind one of those, but really, really critical stuff, I think, makes sense to be wrapped behind something that can be toggled on the fly without having to without having to do a redeploy because a redeploy inevitably leads, will lead to some some form of disruption somewhere whether it's to your day because you have to do all this redeploy work or it's to the end user that notices a slight disruption in service but if you have a setting that can on the fly change that to another route in code you don't have as much of disruption because you don't have to do a, a, some form of redeploy um, and the code is instant if you check for the setting before you execute the code. So it, it's those kind of things that I think will be helpful to, to think through. And I'm not saying that that is what we should do, but I'm saying it's one possible approach. And in the .NET world, um, it's really easy to do that form of like reactive programming, um, especially <clears throat> especially when you're tied into uh, like styles of programming that allow you to build pipelines of code that contain uh, paths like uh, we've talked about propagator blocks before on this channel but 
the ability to basically use a queue within your code and then push your, your push data through a pipeline and then dictate kind of what routes you take uh, is super powerful. Um, and I think this also leads also to how we think about cancellation tokens as well, because if we're seeing a spike in errors at a particular spot, we can trigger that can we can trigger some form of of cancellation based off of what were the the error that we we see to to essentially stop that path of code um additionally if you do add retry logic into your into your code like if you're sending mess if you're publishing messages to a queue and let's say you publish messages to the queue um and then your consumer that's registered to listen to that uh, queue consumes a message off that and does some work to that data and then tries to send it to an API, but that fails. What's going to happen is that you can set it up so that if it's a, if it's a queue technology that does AMQP, uh, adheres to AMQP or a, a, AMQ protocol, um, that error is then inevitably not going to send the acknowledgement back to the message broker or RabbitMQ, whatever it is. So if we have retry logic in there, we can retry that whole thing again to essentially re-get that message, try to execute it, and you know we can retry that a specified number of times. We can do it at a set interval, we can do it with exponential back off, we can do it you know just one time. Um, and it's that level of reactiveness that helps in addition to all the logging and monitoring that I was talking about before, because then if it fails after all the times, it can then send it to an error queue. And the error queue can just be kind of like a, or you're, you might call it a dead letter queue. Um, can be kind of a, we can think of it as like a, a storage for all the failed uh, messages that are just now sitting there um, and that that thing it will kind of remain and if we have a consumer registered to to listen to that we can then pull those off there and then do something with that uh, if you if you look at architecture diagrams for systems uh, you know if you get any kind of like system design book uh, that's out there you'll see like uh, you'll see cues incorporated into various structures of, of system design. Um, you'll see phrases like orchestration uh, or choreography kind of pop up depending on how you want to communicate to those and how you want the communication to be handled from whatever producing service and consuming service. Um, but that, those are the kind of things that blend very nicely into alerting and logging because all that stuff is built with that in, my, in, in mind. And cues, I think, Honestly, when you incorporate a queue into your system, like you, you pretty much will see in every system design book out there, you, you'll kind of see like an intent almost of there is going to be logging for this because the queue basically assumes that we are capturing what's going into the queue, for lack of better words. Um, so all that to say is there's really, really powerful stuff out there, and there's a lot of really, really solid books that go in detail about system design but it's just it's it's hard to it it it, wanted to, it takes a lot of time it takes a lot of time to get all this stuff set up and like anyone you know working in this job time is hard to come by <laughs> to add in all these kind of nice to have things um but if we do add them in then it's just it makes everyone's world just a lot nicer um but unfortunately sometimes you know we just you know it's hard to get the time um so i i, I don't know I, I, I like to continue the conversation i like to hear um what other people are, are reading about uh in terms of alerting or logging or what your personal projects use or really just any unique or creative ideas maybe there's another Maybe there's something else we haven't thought of about how we can handle, how we can create more reactive systems to to logged events. I don't know. If you have any thoughts or, or um, have seen anything really neat around this, uh, let me know. So I'll see you on the next one.